welcome everyone. So today at Access to Perspectives Conversations, we're here with the Sabta Erwin Irawan from Indonesia. He is a hydrogeologist and also a long, well, year-long friend and colleague um, within the open science community of mine. Of, of the share. We have uh, quite a lot of shared friends. Um, and yeah, I'm super happy that you're joining us today to talk about open science and Indonesia and also the work you do with geology. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, me too. Thank you for having me, uh, Joe. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. So, I think we first met, well, also through our common friend John Tennant, um, who I think also influenced both of us quite a bit towards becoming mm -hmm. active for. Um, for open science and open access in particular. Mm. And like, it's also for John's uh, um, support and encouragement that we mm. now have Africa Archive in this world. And yeah. um, could you share about, with us how you started in archive at the time, which is now we're in archive. Yeah. And yeah, maybe also what, what role John played. <laughs> yeah. I th yeah, thank you, Joe, for the question. I think the in archive um, was started. Now, I think we're both kind of have the same uh, history. Um, I think it was around twenty seventeen. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, twenty seventeen. Um, John and I was. Uh, involved in several uh, activities and then uh, he I remember he he got an idea to form a, a preprint server for his uh, paleontology field um, he called uh, the the preprint server uh, paleo archive mm -hmm. and then uh, and then uh, I also have the start to form uh, our own community in Indonesia, uh, our preprint server community. I start to I started to promote uh, the the concept of preprint server in in my community here in Indonesia, and then uh, many responded with positive uh, spirits, and then. Uh, I came to John to talk about how we can make this happen, and then at the same point, uh, I I didn't remember the meeting, but uh, there's this uh, Center for Open Science that that held a joint meeting. Mm -hmm. I didn't remember which, and then uh, they wanted to to gather up uh, communities of preprint server um, uh, ecosystem. And then there uh, we, we were, uh, John and I, in this meeting. And then uh, one way lead to another, the process of preparing the preprint server uh, initiated. And then in August 17, 2017, uh, in archive, uh, is uh, started uh, to operate and also I think the Palio Archive as well and several others uh, preprint server yeah I think so uh, 17th of August 2017 and then in in 2019 uh, it was uh, we several uh, community preprint community leaders including you i guess um receive uh, an announcement from cos that we need to gather up uh, our own funding to help them fund the operation uh, and then uh, they calculated that the in archive had to pay close to in indonesian rupiah would be 200 million yeah 200 million yeah million um one two uh eight zeros million right i think, I think about 25 thousand dollars or something right 
yeah 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 that's number but i i uh, converted into uh, indonesian rupiah i came up with the number 200 million rupiahs that it was very uh, hard and then we're kind of in the middle of uh, thinking of going still still go with the cos and or we need to uh, build another uh, preprint server in in our own uh, server in indonesia and then i started to talk with several uh, stakeholders and and then nothing show up uh, but f f uh, eventually in 2020 uh, early 2020 i think it was in january or february february uh, one this person from Indonesian Science Institute, it's a government institution. Uh, we met uh, in several uh, meetings before, and then in February he uh, called me, and then we have a chat, and then he uh, told me that uh, it would be good if the Inarcaf can be hosted in our institution. Uh, they have this server that also uh, used by several academic journal in Indonesia. So we have this cloud uh, PK uh, OGS cloud OGS server. Yeah, this is the same institution hosted those journals, and then they they told me they have this access capacity still, and then offered me to join them build the preprint server and then yeah we changed the name into uh, RIN archive RIN R I N is the name of the server that they have and then we sort of combine the name from the old in archive to the new names so that's it <laughs> so we, we've been operating since then yeah quite a journey and yeah. also we, we have a similar also like every archive emerged because of RIN archive, because when I saw mm -hmm. there's a national preprint repository, like my, the other co-founder of Africa archive, Justine Agnon, he and I were thinking, um, because he had already proposed, wouldn't it be good to mm -hmm. have a pan-African knowledge hub for mm -hmm. African knowledge, scholarly knowledge, traditional knowledge, encompassing all of that, yeah. in order to have so uh, pretty um, mm. and that's also the spirit that we continue to to follow with Africa Archive. And then when we saw, oh, there's Green Archive on a national level, and you might think, okay, the extrapolation to continent wide uh, yeah. is quite a step. But we also believe that, given the scarcity of infrastructure on the yeah. continent and and the necessity to collaborate, we thought, okay, yeah. it was wide, quite ambitious. But also is, is a is a valid approach to mm -hmm. yeah, to bring the scholarly community continent wide together and also yeah our mission is and I'd like to hear from you like what are the the various benefits that you're trying to generate through the work with Green mm -hmm. Life, and also what have emerged along the way because for us we just saw it goes in all kinds of directions first of all it's about providing visibility for African research yeah. output, research coming out of Africa. Because there's this narrative that oh Africans only contribute so little. And it's not true in our observation to our knowledge because first of all a lot of the research output is still in print, so you yeah. won't find it online. Second, there's all kinds of biases and barriers, like language barrier, yeah. graphical barriers, you name them. It's all documented. <laughs> not by us, but by others, well known. Yeah. Um so we wanted to do something about that also to bring to the attention of African scholars what's being published about Africa yeah. by non-African researchers. Yeah. And therefore, it's not only like we not only accept submissions by African scholars, but also by non-Africans, as long as they publish on any African topic or yeah. African relevant topic. So how what's the scope for Rina Archive and what are the What's the vision and mission and the yeah. steps that you've discovered possibly along the way doing the work? Yeah. So the scope of an archive is 
uh, general uh, science, multidisciplinary science. So we accept uh, scientific papers uh, from uh, all over Indonesia in, in various subjects. Um, mostly, we if we calculate it up to now, uh, we have around 70 documents in our server mostly is uh, natural science so earth science physics uh, and then uh, followed by computer science the the social science and human your uh, hu humanities fields are not so uh, and not so many um, that's uh, the scope and then our mission is I think we kind of have one only one mission uh, to introduce certain level of freedom to to our community here where they can write uh, write up their uh, research and then post it to this preprint server and start to promote it uh based on their objectives right we some of my the users are are uh, they need a place online place to host the the file so they can speak to uh the their counterpart and then show their work um because uh, most institutions in Indonesia don't have a institutional repository that can be used directly by the user. It's always uh, we need to send the, the files into the administri administrative administrator and then the, the admins who upload uh, the document into the repository. So we don't have a very uh, distributed uh, online repository here in Indonesia. Of course, we have researchgate academia.edu, but but they only uh, only researchers that know both service that you can use it. Um, many of the others don't know about those service. So when they see Rin archive, they think they can use it for their own purpose. Of course, we are now applying a uh, pre-moderation pre 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 or what you call it uh, after people submit we need to moderate moderate document the document first and then uh, we can choose uh, whether we should publish it or not yeah not post moderation uh, like the old in archive it's pre moderations mm. yeah that's yeah. also what we do okay mm. so for you it's basically uh, for the indonesian researchers it's to, to gain or to keep control over the research output at the same time also being able to terminate it or to enable research collaboration right mm -hmm. and do you have um so what languages do you did you decide to accept or do you have language restrictions or mm, no. yeah we, we we don't have language res restriction but our uh, users usually upload uh, papers written in english and in indonesia so i i don't know about uh, the african continents but in indonesia we have a very local language we use local lang local language as as for myself, I can speak Indonesian, I can speak Sundanese, I can speak Japanese language. I, I can speak, I use those languages daily, but uh, in our, as our means in communicating our scientific uh, communication, we use Indonesian language. So we only, uh, Although we don't have a language restriction, but Indonesian people are automatically right. They choose to write in Indonesian or in English. Just those two languages for the official scientific languages. Okay. 
Yeah, that's also <laughs> much of what we see across Africa, that especially in the life sciences are being published in yeah. English. We deliberately made submissions open to any, especially African languages. Yeah. Also because Africa has, well, not only English, but also French and Arabic and Portuguese yeah, yeah. as official languages. But then yeah. also increasingly um, the regional and local languages. Yeah. Can, can, can I ask? Yes. Do, uh, do you have this continent's language in in Africa? No, well, that's also a, a challenge that we were dealing with from the start. Yeah. We didn't want to do either French or English. The good thing mm -hmm. is with us co-founders, Justin is Francophone, and I'm German speaking, but I'm not trained. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so therefore, it was also natural to us in this constellation mm -hmm. to, of course, make it multilingual or bilingual at minimum. But then it was like, mm -hmm. for French and English, why not Arabic? And that's yeah. a challenge for us. But then also in our team, we have um two members from egypt from tunisia um yeah. from sudan so they are capable mm. of speaking and checking submissions in arabic so uh, you don't have uh, a similar african language for for no, the there whole continent no, right there's no continent wide oh, okay. language, unfortunately um mm. that's due to colonial history but mm -hmm. there were attempts well at least to introduce a currency across the continent but then it got Well, let's, let's not go into the politics. It's, it's quite sad. Also, it's a huge continent mm -hmm. to think about it. So, imagine, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think it would, would help to have like a trading language for, for the whole yeah. of them. And also to have continent wide initiatives like this um, um, happening easier. But on the other hand, I'm personally invested in also with Africa Archive because we operate multi multilingual by default. It is challenging, but it's also beautiful to see the opportunities. And there's quite a lot of reasonable and feasible workarounds, the language barrier yeah. that we discovered. And one easy way would be to, or that's also what we suggested also to do from the beginning, to provide a transcription of the abstract mm. and that on the title of the manuscript in their mother tongue or mm -hmm. that where you know, there's a regional focus with the work that's presented so that it also enabled science literacy and that it also enabled people who are interested in not necessarily scientists who yeah. understand what the work would be about if they don't know english or french or whatever um but yeah it's not it's not widely adopted but we advocate for that to encourage submissions with your mother languages and and we know that in many countries across the continent it's quite normal to publish in the yeah. Swahili in Tanzania not so much in Kenya but there are also mm. paper or journals in Kenya but they are more in the social sciences and also regional studies yeah. um so they wouldn't go international so easily um And then in South Africa, there is research being published in Afrikaans, Zulu, Kosa. Um, so it is happening. Um, and now, yeah, and we, we want to also showcase that and uh, present that on, on the Africa Archive platform. Because yeah. we present, like we all in our team, we believe that multilingualism, also when you look at the Health Security Initiative, um it is mm -hmm. essential in research we cannot we yeah. cannot all be forced to translate our work into english because there's a lot of yeah. information i believe being lost in translation and yeah. there's also a lot of regional context that can only be expressed in the regional language yeah. and the concept some of this can also be translated and should be translated so i believe that's also yeah. important to have a lingua franca for international collaborations and knowledge exchange. At the same time, yeah. um, we also need the research being published in the local languages. Yeah. So, yeah, I could talk forever about this, but um, <laughs> what's your experience? Like, is there an ex a knowledge exchange inside Indonesia between the English speaking or English publishing communities and those who work mostly in Indonesia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... So I think the, the our community here is kind of 
break can be broken down into two uh, two uh, groups one group is those who works in uh, big and old uh, institutions like myself working in Institute Technology Bandung it's the second oldest uh, universities in Indonesia so you I don't know in Africa but in in Indonesia we have this a group of university big and old university that have uh, more funding uh, inherited from uh, s- several decades ago right so these universities has have the most facilities resources and also they can hire the best uh, lecturers and researchers in Indonesia and, and and then there's this other group the small universities private university that that still struggling their their way to to survive um, in in the market so I think we have this uh discrepancy, discrepancy mm-hmm. from those groups uh these groups my group you can say it's my group <laughs> it's mostly write in english and try to shoot into this uh, prestige journal mm-hmm. right because we our universities also have this burden from the ministry to uh, increase the rank our of our university into this uh, world class uh, ranking mm-hmm. uh, and then this this there's this group the other group um, because they're struggling their way to to just to run the university they don't have uh, yeah the same support like like my group right so they are usually write in Indonesian publishing in Indonesian journal but also this group i can see that this group is the more the most victims of predatory journal right because they they only only see how fast they can publish uh, in certain uh, kind of journals and then they can pay to publish it right so there's this uh, two group um uh, on the other hand both groups are, in my language, are the victim of <laughs> victim of our own assessment uh, system, uh, in which we have to publish in um, either Scopus Index Journal or other journals that has that includes in the Simaco rank. So if we can publish in those journal. Uh, our work can be uh, valued uh, much high score. It is 40 scores, 40 marks for those kind of articles. And then the, the marks start to gradually going uh, smaller if we, uh, if we publish in national journal. So national journal are, is here and those mm-hmm. uh, prestige journal are in here. <laughs> yeah, that's really yeah. Well, sad to observe. I think we have it like, everywhere around the world, really, as a yeah. problematic development, which continues. Um, yeah. Because we need, like we just said, we need national scholarly outlets to be able to also investigate and gain knowledge on our immediate surroundings in our own language. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is also important for, yeah. I mean, for yeah. us in a global yeah, but, context to, to mm-hmm. investigate the but, local and regional yeah. um, ecosystems to draw conclusions for the global scale and many different Yeah, but in, in this situation that we are facing, uh, Joe, um, I think the 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 mission that you are just talking about it's just a side project for those uh, people because mm-hmm. they still have this burden right to publish in in the prestige journal mm-hmm. so in in my take here in, in Indonesia um, my 
I was thinking of how to get those people aside to only work into this way, the mainstream uh, route. How can we drag them to also uh, see this route, right? Yeah. To to try to disseminate their work, which is has been published in prestige journal, in more um, diverse way of dissemination. Like you said, you can take video, you can take posters, right? But in this case, uh, I I am with uh, Victor Venema. Mm-hmm. from Netherlands we are uh, intensely promoting about translate science mm. so here in in Indonesia I also say to the community that you can publish the Indonesian version of the nature publish you have mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> to the paper that you publish in nature yeah. so let's have the Indonesian translation and put it in an archive. Mm. So, um, yeah, so can so more people can read it, right? Yeah. Because although uh, in Indonesia we have English uh, in the early age, but English still is not our conversation language. Mm-hmm. So we still think uh spontaneously in Indonesia and then we have to translate it in our brain to English, right? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's also an often underestimated yeah. um extra effort that mm-hmm. goes yeah. with expertise that you have to learn the English language well enough to yeah. understand the the information in between sentences, kind of like the phrases, what they mean, how they yeah. mean and how the meaning of a sentence changes when you put the comma yeah. and all of that. So that's a level of detail and language profession, proficiency. Um, yeah. It takes years and decades to, to embrace. Um, with Africa Archive, also, like, we are, we are also a part of that community with Translate Science. So we, um, we also run a project currently in writing or having translators, science mm-hmm translators in or no regular translators who translate from english articles to african languages so yeah. we have this pro- project with an organization called Masakana. there's also science link which is a south african um, science literacy organization or science journalism organization there is also a company from south africa who yeah. works on a continental level with translators mm-hmm. Um, their mission is, or they say, we speak African, <laughs> I guess, mm. but African means thousands of languages, literally. Language, yeah. Um, so in that project, it's called Decolonized Science. And also for your listeners, you'll find the links of the organizations and activities and initiatives that we mentioned in this conversation in the show notes yeah. and the associated blog post. But this Decolonized Science project is where we we also thought in the beginning we, we would translate research articles one to one into African languages, mm. and then it turned out that in many African languages that we are translating into, the the terms are not there. And we knew that from the beginning we would also design a glossary from scratch mm-hmm. of terms mm-hmm. in African languages that we had to invent first or the translators had to invent first because the the science terms did not exist or still do not exist in many languages um but then it turned out like the methodology and also the level of detail that research articles come with is like at at this stage for for many languages not that the languages are poor in numbers of words or concepts but it's just technical and the language or languages who are mostly still spoken only, there's not much mm. um, written documentation, which we are now creating. Um, mm. So then we figured we are going to write summaries that extend the abstract, or that's yeah. what the science journalists do. So first translate the research into a lay summary, which is um, mm. Mm. a little bit more informative than the abstract alone. Mm-hmm. And that can then be translated into the African languages to mm-hmm. then allow also the locals, the native 
language speakers to understand the concept that we're trying to convey and not yeah not coming up with scientific terms which in an, in another language wouldn't make sense for for the locals to comprehend yeah so that's basically what we're currently in the process of with the Google science project and it's quite exciting to see there's also a lot mm. of work that goes into it that we yeah. anticipated and then you get to work and you see the level of detail and attention that needs to go to yeah it's, it's and really also it's very challenging yeah. and exciting and time. and also uh, our energy our own energy as the promoters of open science yeah. can be up and down right sure. so by <laughs> by having this kind of chat i think we can increase our energy <laughs> each, yeah. each other energy right I think so too. Yeah, it's really exciting to exchange about the experiences made and also what we see as opportunities coming out of it and mm -hmm. tangible benefits mm -hmm. coming out of this. So we hope that we we'll also be able, like after we then successfully translated 180 English articles into African languages, we we'll mm -hmm. will expand that and also hope that it will copied will be copied in other regions because Europe mm -hmm. also needs that desperately. I think in Asia, there's many examples that, where we could do similar um, activities. Uh, you wonder why, why did nobody else do that? <laughs> Just said, and I'm sure yeah. it has been done on smaller scales. And I don't know, and there's also many people who don't know about our activities. So it's also a matter yeah. of communicating about it. A lot of things are possible if you put, you know, if you put your heads together and just get to work and yeah. find a way that keeps the work manageable and not overwhelming to just a few, but to organize it in a yeah. way that makes sense for a larger group to be done to. Yeah. Um, with your work on open science and open access in Indonesia, do you, do you see similar developments in neighboring countries? Yeah, I, I just, I was just having this uh, talk with the Malaysians. Uh, so the Malaysian has initiated this Malaysian Open Science Platform. They call it MOSP. Uh, I haven't get into the details about their programs, but I have in touch with uh, some of the, the uh, leaders. Um, I think we we can work together on this. Um, so I was sharing my idea uh, about open science to, to their uh, community. Uh, it was a very, uh, I was very honored because in Indonesia, I haven't been invited to this national level meeting, <laughs> but I, I get the invitation from the Malaysian, so uh, it's kind of, uh, it's, I'm very honored um, last month. Um, also, we, in Indonesia, we have this organization called uh, Indonesian Academic, I don't know the translation uh, to English. It's kind of similar to the, what Malaysian have. Uh, Malaysia have a, a, a Malaysian academic dot gov. The, I, I can't remember the, the website, but the, this organization in Indonesia is similar to what the Malaysian have, but the Malaysian has more progressive action toward, towards open science than, than this organizations in Indonesia. Uh, I think if I can share the details and the uh, roadmap of the Malaysian Open Science Platform. Maybe I can spark something into the Indonesian community. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know about the other uh, Asian country like Cambodian, uh, Thailand, uh, Singapore, but we have this meeting uh, in a Southeast Asia uh, scope last year at the Cyanos. Mm -hmm. 
Seano's mm-hmm. uh, meeting, it's the level is in uh, Southeast Asia. We have many participants also coming from those countries uh, also, um, but they still haven't get into the point and that we they have to gather up to build something. So I think in the Southeast Asian level, I think it's just Mal- the Malaysia and Indonesia. Also Singapore, but Singapore kind of still in a university level. Yeah, I think so. But uh, I haven't heard about any other movement at national level. Yeah, I think. Uh, India, I have just got back to the uh, yeah okay. yeah India um, yeah because India is is in a separate uh, section yeah, yeah, of the Asia so I, yeah I haven't thought about India I I was uh, only talking about the Southeast Asia <laughs> yeah also I I asked you about the neighbors directly but it's just it's just been announced I think last week or the week before that India Archive was also in the circle of Center of Open Science Open Science Framework based preprint repositories and then yeah. they experienced similar challenges like us and it's also understandable to some extent that the yeah. of science of course needs to have their costs covered um so yeah. all of us communities were looking to to collect the means and also for it we were just mm. lucky unluckily that we didn't have as many submissions to get um presented with such a big invoice um yeah, but we're now also at a similar stage where we need to find um, partners on national and regional levels to, yeah, to also give Africa Archive a home. We now have a home with TCC Africa, which is a Kenyan organization for science communication operating across mm-hmm. the continent um, mm-hmm. for science um, communication trainings, but also open science and open access advocacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and similar to you, we're we're, I would almost say, desperately looking for a partner who is willing to host an African built repository. And we're also looking mm-hmm. at what OPS, um, the Open Preprint System by the Public Knowledge Project, KP in Canada. Um, so, yeah, India Archive now announced that they also built or have now a national partner to run the repository with. So these are good developments, and I think we can also be grateful for the collaboration with the Center for Open Science for getting the idea started in the first yeah. place and now being able to grow from yeah. there into mm-hmm. regionally and nationally owned scholarly mm-hmm. um, community services. Um, so mm-hmm. at the end of the day, irrespective of the pain in between, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's still a good development and was why and also necessary um, to some extent. And it's it's great that we call, can all learn from and with each other, and to build yeah. a network of, you know, spread around the world of scholarly communities and services that all contribute to open science and also open science infrastructure, which then again enables knowledge exchange on a global scale. And this is also something I would like to maybe spend a few minutes talking um, with you about. How do we see? Mm-hmm now how open science and open access and the services such as green archive india archive um Cielo, Latin america do you yeah. see an uptake of like in your case indonesian research into the international knowledge exchange is indonesian yeah. research more recognized since green archive inception and operation yeah i th- in in my opinion, um, the situation of open access and open science in, in 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 international level is very much. I think it's not very different from we know maybe five or ten years ago because uh, most of the infrastructure is still in, at the hands of the publishers, so. I think they, we haven't been able to escape uh, 
uh, our um, our what you call it our workflow as a scientist as a academia uh, to be able to yeah escape from from the domination of the publisher but if we see the the activities like yourself and the india archive and uh, what we have here in indonesia i think it's very important to to bring a balance into the system because uh, yeah we can we always can say that uh, you need to think about what you uh, sent into the publishers because uh, the I think the the spirit in international level is shifting into rights retention I think so you can choose whatever publisher that you can uh, work on and you can what whatever publisher that you can uh, afford if it has APC but remember to retain your uh, rights so you can use the services from the the open science community uh, and maximize your work right i think w w the situations is kind of shifting into that way because if we still uh, try to bring the voice to uh, say uh, don't believe in to publishers don't go into these prestige journals i think we can go we can do nothing because they have all the resources right uh also we we still i i think we still need uh, the, those uh publishers to i don't know to get more attention to our uh, work here but uh at some point we need to uh deliver what you call uh freedom to publish right uh it's not the journal it's the work that counts right mm -hmm. i think that's at some point we need to uh, always say that right but in in this in current situation uh in order to go there we need to change our perspective to to uh how to retain our rights i think mm. right yeah this is also what we um explain to our users with africa archive that by mm. using our partner services which mm -hmm. will allocate your eyes and open licenses so that the ownership of the manuscript yeah. remains with the researcher and then the researcher can choose a license to allow for dissemination and reuse yeah. according to CCI, yeah. like attribution. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and then basically, yeah, it's, an, and then, like you said, it's, you know, the researchers can submit wherever they think they want to afford to publish it or whatever yeah. they need to pursue their careers. Yeah. Um, as much as what well, I also gave a course yesterday um, on knowledge transfer, and I was okay. like we came to talk about the San Francisco Declaration on on Research Assessment, Dora, mm -hmm. Dora, and and the yeah and the participants I asked them check your home university if they are signatories of Dora. Turns out many were. But the mm. scholars were not aware. And also yeah. the PhD regulation asked them to publish in certain journals still, even yeah. though the institution as a whole had already signed DORA. Yeah. <laughs> like, so okay, not all the, yeah, not all the leaders, yeah. yeah. Not all the leaders of the university aware that they like, uh, signed the DORA yeah. as well, right? <laughs> And then how do you address that? And I encourage them, so maybe you want to talk to some of the management and not in an accusative way, but, you know, because they, this is what they know, this is what they have learned themselves. So it's mm -hmm. change your system that works for you. 
but you know, just bring it to the attention politely and gently. Like, look, yeah. this is what Dora says. We actually, as this institution, we actually signed yeah. Dora. It makes sense because ABC. How about we change the PhD regulation? <laughs> Maybe you want to tweak some of the paragraphs and what's necessary to receive the PhD. <laughs> Is yeah. there similar conversations also what you've observed? Uh, in Indonesia, I think the perspective is still very narrow. So I keep, I need to keep uh, challenging the system, right? So literally uh, every day if I saw opportunity to enter into a conversation, I would go into the conversation and try to twist the way of thinking, mm -hmm. right? For instance, like uh, if uh, when my university and most university in Indonesia are are com writing uh, uh, funding, budgeting uh, plan, uh, they keep saying about we have uh, such a low budget to publish and so on and so on and then I try to uh, bring into the conversation that uh, we have if you know we have this low funding to publish why we should keep chasing to publish in those journals right mm. but instead of uh, looking for ways to to follow up my my challenge those leaders start to think that so the only way is for for us to publish in those press journal is by collaborating with other universities that can pay the NPCs, right? I, yeah, you know the the yeah. It's very practical. It's still very practical way of thinking. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what happens <laughs> inside there. <laughs> Well, I think so, it's like human yeah. nature. You have it also in Germany with some, it's like, it's all about prestige and, ah, I don't know what some of us are describing. Yeah, at the same point, they agree with me that our life as uh, academia is very dependent, dependent, dependent into those brands, mm -hmm. right, uh, built by commercial entities, but at the same time, they, I, they, they cannot find uh, more energy to try to change that. So I don't know. Maybe after several generations, maybe we can <laughs> go into whatever we dream of right right now. I don't know, mm. but it's our task to keep challenging them to mm. work. Yeah, because. Uh, it's very logic. The, the thinking is very logic. Uh, we have low funding, but at the same time, we we going to spend this low funding into other parties, right? Uh, even if uh, we collaborate with other university that can pay the, the ABC or, or subscribe to a paywall journal, it's still, it's the, their government money, right? <laughs> so, I don't know. Um, and at the end of the yeah, day, it's taxpayers' money, and then you lose it on yeah, 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 yeah. One, one way or the other, right? Um, so, talking about your profession as a scholar in the discipline mm. of hydrogeology, how Geology, yeah. have you have you seen the field change through open science influence? Or the way, I mean, the field, as yeah. in, is there more exchange now in the field of geology? Is there, now that scholars, maybe not the masses, but certain yeah. groups of scholars become aware of the opportunity to compare not only Scopus and Web of Science, but also search other databases where they're getting access to scholarly output. It's coming out of yeah. repositories like Green Archive and, and other. Yeah. Yeah, in my field, uh, in earth science, we have, we always uh, have this problem about data availability. So, uh, in this case, I've been actively participate 
in a series of workshops of uh, environmental awareness uh, program in my university. So my the participants is are mostly not academia. They're mostly engineering consultant working into these uh, private companies that they, they all both working into environmental geology and also hydrogeology. Uh, in my sense, if I talk about this data availability and how they can uh, store the, the, their data uh, and how can they also can get uh, their names, the, the reputation of their firm or their company increase if they can show up their work more freely to the public, they can get my message more than uh, if I talk into to academias <laughs> in, in Indonesia. So I think uh, this is another way, another uh, way that we can adopt. So if we can uh, speak into other parties outside the academia, maybe um, in my case, uh, engineering consultant, and then also uh, the government, uh, regional government. Mm -hmm. They also have this website, this server repository. Uh, why don't they make those information openly available for the public? So if there's someone wants to map the hydrology situation of a certain location, those people don't have to start from zero, right? So there's accumulation of data, at least in, in the regional government server. So I'm aiming into different uh, road right now because I have this, I have this uh, uh, chances, uh, uh, these workshops, series of workshops that I uh, regularly uh, organize so I can speak to more engineering consultant, engineering uh, uh, companies, and also regional government. Mm. Maybe the open science would be run by them, not by the academia in Indonesia, who knows? <laughs> yeah, and also, why not? Unless you have a totalitarian state. I mean, not in Indonesia, but like um, not yeah. in other parts of the world. Um, so, this is also what we were hoping for Africa Archive to achieve to build a system that's deep and that cannot be corrupted over time, irrespective of any political um, or yeah. economic development. Um, yeah, and I don't know if such a system can ever be put in place, but we're we're looking into it, and also therefore one to with more than one um, host institution. But yeah, that's that's quite a journey to take, and I think that's also <laughs> the mission for open science because if you think about it, why do we do research in the first place? It seems as if we're only talking to each other as scholars, but the I mean also industry then kind of recruit some researchers into their companies to, mm -hmm. to capture the knowledge for economic development, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a natural thing to occur. But from when I speak to early career researchers, many have a purpose or see a purpose in the work that they do to leave a legacy or to, to con contribute to the betterment of human society and the environment, mm -hmm. or mitigating climate change, and that. But, and then through open science, as you say, we need to make our work more accessible to other stakeholders of society, mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. the industry, including policymakers, including journalists and the general public so that we can create science literacy or foster science mm -hmm. literacy that, yeah, and the trust and reliability in science, but also both ways. And I think that's also what open science yeah. has achieved to foster a level of trust and self-accountability for scholarship. Yeah. Um, yeah, so not to be corrupted along the way or to lead into bad science as that was also yeah, yeah, yeah. Alone, um, which easily happens when you apply pressure to mm -hmm. 
So. Yeah. Great. Um, so we spoke for like almost an hour now. Is there some <laughs> things, I mean, um, also this is not to be, oh, oh, this is certainly to be continued. So I'm already looking forward to another conversation for us to have um, at any point in the future. But yeah. at this time, would you like to kind of, what, what else would you like to have mentioned? Kind of concluding on the very yeah. few things that we already touched upon. Yeah, I think uh we need to have more more ways right to disseminate our results uh if we need to increase our uh career so be it just publish in in those places journal if you can but make sure to have another ways right to disseminate uh, what you publish in those journals, right? In form of various products. Mm -hmm. I think that is our way how to get both worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Because we need the career. I cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot avoid that. We need uh, increase of career, but also we need to uh, play our role in the community itself mm -hmm. so it's not just about publishing something and then just stop but publish and then disseminate because publishing is not the same like dissemination mm -hmm. because <laughs> publishing is just going to get into the same uh, people as we do right very narrow community mm -hmm. I yeah think. and yeah i agree <laughs> so that's and that for researchers sometimes seems like an extra effort and certainly there yeah. but the revenue that comes from disseminating your own work also yeah. leaves us with the control over how we want right. to disseminate it who gains yeah. access, um and not just a prestigious yeah. group of, of yeah. scholars who can afford to pay yeah. You, to yeah, but also anyone who needs yeah, it. you can get your reputation through this mm. way of dissemination. You can get a more acknowledgement as well. So yeah. don't worry, it, it will get back to you. <laughs> exactly. And then we can also seek feedback from scholars who have information to share with us by making our work accessible. And also feedback with from um, from no scholars, right? Non -scholars. People, yeah, non scholars. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's a it's a win either way. So mm -hmm. <laughs> go out there, tweet about your research articles. Make sure they're accessible. Um, mm -hmm. Don't just share the link to the journal, but to the yeah. um, preprint archive where you yourself mm -hmm. shared mm -hmm. it in a way that then makes your work accessible. And mm -hmm. because I also had a colleague the other day who was so proud, oh, finally I managed to to share my paper in this journal. It turns out it was closed access. I was like, right, good mm -hmm. for you. Why are you sharing this? Yeah. And then people have to pay thirty dollars to read it. Can you please share it <laughs> on a free print repository? And then he said, like, look, I actually did this, and here's the link. He's like, right, you yeah. need to share that one in the first place. <laughs> um, next time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so there's, yeah, it's actually, it's just a few mouse clicks, so it's not a lot of extra work. And if you wonder how to do that, feel free to re reach out to Desaptor yeah. or Bob. We're very happy to explain yeah. to you what little effort it takes to make the work acceptable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. All the best and yeah, all the best wishes for your next adventures in yeah. Uh, collaborating with the governments and policy makers. Yeah, you too. Stay healthy. That's the important yeah. thing. Yeah, <laughs> healthy to keep doing work. <laughs> yeah.